Welcome back to this uh, second lecture on reconstruction. Uh, I introduced some of the big issues um, in our last lecture. Today I want to talk about um, two things. One, um, President Johnson's impeachment and uh, how reconstruction comes to an end. Uh, President Johnson and the radical Republicans are, are butting heads throughout his uh, tenure as president. Uh, you'll recall he took office in April of uh, 1865 upon the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Presidential Reconstruction is considered to be too lenient uh, towards Southerners by the radical Republicans in the Congress. And um, these two political uh, powers are going to go at each other for the remainder of Johnson's presidency. Uh, the radical Republicans in the Congress passed the Reconstruction Act in uh, 1867. Uh, Johnson vetoes this act. Uh, the radical Republicans override his veto. Uh, this act is going to extend the Freedmen's Bureau, which we talked about last time, and it's going to divide the southern states up into military districts uh, occupied by Union forces. Again, the radical Republicans treating the South as a conquered territory. The uh, fight between the Radical Republicans and Johnson is going to continue. In Johnson's cabinet is Edwin Stanton. He is the Secretary of War. He was Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of War. This is the man who uh, prosecuted the war for Lincoln, um, a somewhat uh, tyrannical bureaucrat by most accounts, but also a very capable one. He, uh, Stanton, is a friend of the Radical Republicans in the Congress. President Johnson does not like him and he wants him out of his cabinet. Uh, being President of the United States, Johnson believes he has the prerogative to fire uh, any cabinet member that he wishes. Now, this is where it gets tricky. In order to protect Edwin Stanton's job as Secretary of War, his radical Republicans in the, his friends, the radical Republicans in the Congress, pass what's called the Tenure of Office Act. Now, this is easy to understand. The Tenure of Office Act says simply that if you hold a position in the government that requires Senate confirmation, then you cannot be fired without Senate approval. And you've seen this in your own lifetimes. You know that the President nominates somebody for the Supreme Court or the president nominates uh, a new general or a head of the CIA or uh, uh, an ambassadorship or a cabinet position. The president nominates, but that doesn't make any of this so. What has to happen, of course, is that the Senate has to confirm the nomination. Uh, that again, of course, goes back to republicanism that we talked about the last time, how power spread very thinly in this country. Uh, the President nominates, the Senate confirms. The Tenure of Office Act says, well, Edwin Stanton, uh, when he became Secretary of War, he had to be confirmed by the Senate. Therefore, you cannot fire Stanton in, without Senate approval. Uh, Johnson, President Johnson being uh, stubborn, uh, pig-headed, I think was the term used by his opponents, uh, decided he's going to fire Stanton anyway, and he does. Now, what does the Constitution say about a president who breaks the law? Uh, I believe the phrase is high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, that will lead to impeachment. Now, many Americans are confused by this term impeachment. It does not, remove, it does not mean removal from office. What it means is a trial. And if found guilty, then you can be removed from office. Of course, we've had uh, only two impeachments in U.S. history. President Johnson, who we're talking about here in the 1860s, and in your own lifetime, uh, President Bill Clinton was impeached and uh, was acquitted and remained in office. Now, Johnson is going to fire Edwin Stanton. This breaks the law. It breaks the law, the Tenure of Office Act. On this basis, the radical Republicans uh, in the House bring forth bills of impeachment um, the Senate tries the president on these charges, 
and President Johnson is acquitted. He survives impeachment by one vote. Now, I want to end this lecture by talking about um, the end of Reconstruction. Reconstruction will come to an end with the election of 1876. Uh, so Reconstruction lasts how long? About 12 years, 1865, 1876, 11 years. Um, what happens in the election of 1876 is that the election is too close. Uh, there's no uh, majority of the vote in either um, the Electoral College or popular vote. The two candidates, the Democrat, Samuel Tilden, uh, does receive uh, a small plurality of the popular vote, but the electoral vote is too close to call. What are we going to do about this? Um, the election is thrown into the House to decide. Now, you've seen this in your own lifetime. Uh, in 2000, Al Gore and George W. Bush, um, the election was too close to call. Even though Al Gore won a plurality of the popular vote, the Supreme Court of the United States awarded the contested votes of Florida to George W. Bush, making him president. Um, something very similar to this is happening in 1876. Now, you can check the, uh, the map of the election uh, on D2L to see how this is going to work out. You'll notice that the South is solidly Democratic except for three states, Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. Uh, the South was solidly democratic from the Civil War all the way up into the eight, uh, 1960s, the modern civil rights movement. I know many of you will find this hard to believe, but you could not find a Republican office holder in the South for nearly 100 years. This will all change in the 1960s when the South becomes very conservative and uh, the civil rights movement is taking place and white southerners will abandon the Democratic Party and begin flocking to the Republican Party. Uh, in the 1960s, the Republican Party becomes the conservative party and that's where southerners feel most at home. So for a hundred years we called it the Solid South um, because it voted solidly Democratic. Now, if you take a look at this map of the election of 1876, you'll see that there are three states that go Republican. Uh, the question, of course, is why? The Republican politicians um, representing the Republican candidate, Rutherford B. Hayes, they approached the electors in those three southern states, Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina, and they make a political deal. They assure those three states that if they'll throw their electoral votes to the Republican candidate, Hayes, that once uh, in office, Hayes will end Reconstruction. Uh, the hated occupation of the southern states by federal armies, uh, the presence of the Republican Party here, uh, the elevation of African Americans. Uh, here, white southerners see a chance to throw off uh, this oppressive Reconstruction regime. So, the electors of Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina throw their vote to the Republicans, allowing Rutherford B. Hayes to become President of the United States, ending Reconstruction. The Republicans keep their word, they withdraw federal armies from the South, and leave Southerners to work out their problems on their own, basically. Uh, and this includes the race problem, uh, which will turn very bad for uh, African-American citizens. Now, there's one other aspect of this deal that I will mention. The Southerners are going to acquire what, at the time, was the, one of the best patronage jobs in the U.S. government. Patronage, is, of course, is a, is a way that politicians have of awarding their friends with jobs. Uh, the president obviously has the best job for patronage because he gets to appoint a lot of people to positions. But in 1876, who do you think is second on that list for political patronage? Uh, it's hard to believe and hard to picture today, but in 1876, the only manifestation of the federal government in every village, in every town and city in this country would have been the post office. That's the one sign of the federal government throughout the country. 
and a southerner is going to be awarded the position of Postmaster General. Uh, this position will allow a southerner to appoint friends and associates um, to post offices all across the country. And in this way, uh, Reconstruction is going to come to an end. Now, this is going to take us to what historians call the New South. And I'm just going to briefly characterize the New South for you as it follows Reconstruction. Uh, the best way to do this is to compare the Old South, the Antebellum South, or the South before the war, Antebellum, uh, to the South that follows the war. Uh, slavery is replaced. What takes its place as a form of labor? Uh, sharecropping. And we'll talk about sharecropping in more detail later. Uh, the leadership of the South is going to change. The slave-owning class is dead. Uh, what's going to emerge now in the New South are a group of middle-class professionals, uh, educated people, lawyers, editors, um, professors, doctors, so on and so forth, businessmen, captains of industry, they call them. Uh, you're going to have a rising class of middle-class cl middle professionals taking the place of the old planter class in the New South. Um, you'll remember that the Old South uh, was dependent upon one commodity crop, cotton. The New South is also going to be dependent upon one commodity crop, cotton. But there's going to be a slight difference. You're going to see uh, in the latter part of the 19th century uh, a rising industrialization in the South. We're going to begin to build cotton mills here. And we're going to begin to um, process uh, this commodity crop here in the South. Uh, so these are some of the changes between the Old South and the New. I should mention, uh, in addition to this, there is a democratic, uh, not democratic, but a demographic change. The Old South, the coastal cities dominated, uh, New Orleans, Mobile, uh, Savannah, Charleston, Norfolk. The coastal cities tended to dominate. In the New South, this is going to change. The population is going to shift inward to the Piedmont cities. Uh, Raleigh, Durham, Columbia, South Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, Birmingham, Alabama, Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, so there's a Democrat demographic shift from the coastal cities inward a couple of hundred miles to the Piedmont cities. So these changes uh, are fundamental. And there's one additional change that we'll talk about when we discuss Jim Crow, but I'm just going to mention it here. The New South is going to see the rise, uh, a dramatic rise, in lynching. As Southerners increasingly um, gain control of white democratic governments called the Redeemer governments, uh, they are redeeming the white South from Reconstruction and Republicans. Uh, increasingly, Southerners are going to um, use an extra legal system of justice to impose or to maintain white supremacy, uh, and that will include lynching. Um, in our next session, uh, we'll talk about Jim Crow, and uh, we'll look at some lynching photos and, uh, and see if we can untangle uh, these images, which are quite startling and very troubling uh, even today. So I'm going to stop there for the time being, and we'll talk about Jim Crow next time. Thank you.